Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, you know, as, as you were just told, we've been here all week. You might have seen us occupying this space and sort of frantically hacking um, our way through the week. So, so yeah, this week uh, we've been here since Monday um, for an event called Astro Hack Week. This is the third time this event happens. Um, it was really, it's really one of the uh, events that are organized by the Moore and Sloan Data Science Initiative um, that is a cooperation between BIDS and NYU and University of Washington. And it's been one of these things that really all three institutions have organized together. So our organization team has come from all three. And this is now the third time it happens. The first time was in Seattle, the second time was in New York. This time it was Berkeley's turn. Um, but it was really um, more and slow enough to have made that possible, both in terms of the funding, but also in bringing the right people together. So um, what is Astro Hack Week? I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail. Basically, for the last five, uh, five days, around 50 of us have been in this space. Um, the people that were here represent sort of all of astronomy, all of the different subfields in astronomy. We've given tutorials, we've given lectures, and we've been hacking. Um, there are 28 projects currently in progress, and the people who are now not here are some are in the paleontology museum to hack, some of them are out in a cafe, and they're frantically working because at 3.30, we're going to have our wrap-up session where everyone presents what they've been working on. Um, so you might now sit there and ask, why? Why, why would you do this? And that's a very good question. Um, the answer is sort of twofold. And the first answer is that in all of science, data is, has been exploding for the last few years. Um, and you here at BIDS probably know this as well as I do. Here's just an example. Um, this is an astronomy data archive, one of many. And this is just basically a plot of how the data increased between 2008 and 2014. And that's here in terabyte. And so they've gone from maybe like 30 terabyte to more than 650 terabyte in these few years. And so somehow, all that data, out of all that data, we would like to get science out of it. So we need to figure out how. Um, and that's not only a problem for astronomy. Um, you know, social scientists have started doing analyses with Twitter data, and Twitter data seems to be growing exponentially. The LHC and CERN are producing massive data sets. Um, and then one thing to point out is that it's not just data that we collect from real sources, but these are climate uh, simulations. And these big simulations are basically you can consider data too, because they produce massive amounts of information that you somehow need to mine. Um, and so in terms of another example from astronomy, this is how astronomy used to work. It used to be someone who goes to a telescope, who looks through the telescope, who makes a photographic plate of what they want to, to observe. And then they, by hand, looked at that photographic plate and did their research. Um, this is not what we can do today. Um, this is an example of what's going to happen in the next few years. This is the Square Kilometer Array, which is currently being built in South Africa and um, Australia. And that Square Kilometer Array will produce 960,000 terabytes of raw data per day. Um, so that's a lot of data that we're starting, that we start to have to take uh, into account. Yeah? Oh, I'll take questions whenever. These two? Pardon? So uh, it, maybe it's kind of a prosaic uh, observation, but looking at that ramp up, which maybe looks a little sigmoidal now, uh, there, there were increased costs. Where it raises the question of where's the data being stored and what are the cost burdens of, of that uh, aside, fr aside from the, the functionality that, that having that data gives. And uh, I mean, with, with magnet, you know, like a, an 8x over four years sort of thing, that must mean that expenses are perhaps shifting. 
Um, yes. So I am not an expert in the sort of structure of data management in astronomy, but I think, I mean, this is, this is um, an infrared science archive that's run by NASA. This is all from tele space telescopes that are run by NASA, and NASA has an growing awareness um, that they need to do data management, and they are actually starting to do some data management for products produced by the community. But yes, I mean, there's another project called LSST, which is a big US project, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and their software budget alone is around $50 million. And a serious, a considerable fraction goes into a data management group that sits at, sits at six different um, institutions and over five to 10 years produces the archive and produces the necessary infrastructure. Um, there's work that's being done with NCSA, with the National Computing Facility. Um, so I think there's growing awareness also within the funding agencies that this is a problem. But it is true that sort of long-term storage is something that's not entirely solved especially for the SKA, for example. Right, yes. Yeah, so that's actually not something we've talked about much this week, except for a tutorial on databases. Um, but it is, it is true that is one of the problems. Um, any other questions? OK, so what I'm trying to say is basically that the modern data that we gather is heterogeneous. It comes from different sources that need to be incorporated. It is usually complex. The data that I work with in my daily life is actually not that big. It's big enough, it's small enough that you can store it on a hard disk. But it's usually very complex. It usually has strange, strange sources of uncertainty. It's usually uh, my time series are not continuous. They have gaps in them. And there's all sorts of clever ways you need to try and figure out how to deal with them. Um, a lot of data is dirty, especially data like Twitter data that comes from the, you know, from the real world. Um, but, and then there's this big problem of high volume and high velocity, which is current, mostly called big data. And so this is not only something that happens in academia that's been happening in the sort of data science industry along for a while now. And the response to that was to have a sort of data science, new thing called data science that incorporates different things, including statistics, advanced computing, visualization, but also domain expertise. And scientists traditionally, I certainly, um, when I think back to my undergrad and to my PhD, we're sort of actually only trained in a subset of that. Um, and that subset is not enough anymore to really deal with, with the um, data that we're getting. Um, and so the point is that I think academia is really lagging behind industry in methods development and in data-driven research. Um, and Jake van der Plas, who's at our uh, partner institution, has had two very good blog posts on that. So the question that we were asking ourselves is how do we encourage researchers to learn and adopt new methodology? How do we get them to even talk to um, people who work on the methods? The other question that we were asking ourselves is within our field. If you think about traditional conferences, they're very seg where people normally exchange knowledge, they're very segregated uh, by subdiscipline. So here's just like, I just picked up the banners from the next few conferences in the next year. And you know, there's like an international workshop of spectral stellar libraries or physics of the intra-cluster medium. And these are extremely specialized subfields within astronomy. But if all you ever do is hang out with people who work on the physics of intra-cluster medium, you'll never figure out what the exoplanet people are doing. And maybe they're actually developing methods that help you. Um, but you would never know about it. And it, that problem is even worse when you think about data problems between disciplines. We don't know what people in climate science are doing, but they might be developing the next best tool that will help us deal with the SKA data. So the qu second question we had was, how do we get researchers to talk to each other about methods? Um, and so our general objectives for running this workshop is to teach new data science methods to researchers 
and to increase connectedness between them. And that includes sort of fostering exchange between, between disciplines. It also includes built networks and lasting collaborations that people can then expand on once they go home. Um, and the sort of final, final goal is to promote open science so that people, that other people who cannot make it to the workshop can take advantage of this too. And so our answer to this is Astor Hackweek, and I'm going to try to convince you that that's a good idea um, and that we can actually deliver on these goals. So in order to explain to you what Astor Hackweek is, I'm actually going to start explaining by what Astor Hackweek is not. Astor Hackweek is not a conference. If I think about conferences, that's sort of the picture I think of. And that's a bit unfair because I actually searched for like bored scientists at conference when I looked for a picture. But what I would like to convey here is that traditional conferences are often knowledge transfer from someone standing in the front to an audience that might listen or might not listen. And there's very limited time for actual exchange during breaks or in the evening. And that happens sort of accidentally. It's not the main reason for the conference, usually. Um, the second comment is that there is a difference. What conferences do is what one of our participants called science-driven communications. You have someone standing in front talking about their results. They don't usually talk how they got there. When I prepare conference talks, they just say, you know, here's the problem, and here's this awesome result I got, and here's all the exciting physics that I got out. What we wanted to do is data-driven communication. We wanted people to talk about, here are the data sets that we have and the problems we have with those data sets. And then someone else could stand up and said, I actually have that same problem, and I can help you solve that. So if you think about how Astro Hack Week works, it's really, I have hundreds of pictures of like a bunch of people standing around a laptop discussing together about a certain data problem. The other thing it's not, it's not a summer school. Even though we have tutorials, um, summer schools are, ex are traditionally top down. So you have senior scientists on the front who will teach junior scientists something about their expertise. This is exactly not what we want. The Hack Week principle is that everyone learns from everyone. Um, and especially in a lot of ways, junior people are better at adopting new methods and adopting new technologies. So we try to um, admit both junior people who are experts at things and senior people who are open to learning from them. So there is a much more level playing field in terms of teaching. Um, OK, let me tell you a bit more about how it works. The ingredients are kind of uh, three things. We have tutorials, we have breakout sessions, and we have hacking. Um, and they all sort of make up a very, very mix of what people actually do at Astro Hack Week. Um, the first time we ran tutorials, we kind of decided on a bunch of topics that we thought would be interesting for the field and then ran them. Um, and that worked really well. So the next time, we just gave people a really vague message and said, we're just going to do data-driven stuff. They applied anywhere, which we're, we were really glad about. But we asked them, what would you like to learn about? Um, and this, I don't know how well you can see this, but this was our Astro 2015 board of topics that people were interested in. And we just wrote them all down. And it turns out there are sort of fields that emerge. And one of them is kind of inference and sort of Bayesian statistics and MCMC. Um, they're sort of data-driven stuff like classification and machine learning. Um, there's sort of exploratory data analysis and sort of big data methods. And so from there, we then came up with some kind of, kind of program. And that, worked, that sort of bootstrapping has worked really well. Uh, one thing that we learned is that actually tutorials at Astro Hack Week are scarier for the lecturers than for the participants. And this is because on almost any topic, there will be experts in the room. And we got a lot of feedback from our lecturer saying, it's like, oh, but what if I say something that's maybe not entirely correct? And oh, that person in the room is much more of an expert at it than I am. Um, so the solution that we had to this is that we encourage a lot of peer learning. Because it's such a diverse group, um, what we did was basically put people in groups. And there was someone who was lecture, who would give a bit of a lecture, and then do exercises. And during the exercises, we asked the other experts in the room to help. 
So we encouraged participants to help with the teaching, which worked out really well. Um, and that is a sort of formal, that is the formal institute, the formal learning that we instituted. But that is all the sort of, the tutorials are all the formal teaching that we implemented. But then what we encouraged are so-called breakout sessions. And they were usually short tutorials, sort of 30 to 45 minutes, that um, we encouraged participants to lead. And they were usually on topics that came up during the week. Oftentimes, they were sort of further topics on something that was considered uh, discussed in the lectures. But oftentimes, they were just sort of practical things that came up. So we actually have a lot of things like profiling Python or licensing code and all the sort of practical things that come up in a researcher's daily life, but that they don't necessarily learn about. Um, and one of the nice things about these tutorials is that they're usually quite on the spot and very informal. So usually someone stands up. Um, like here and said, I can talk about Gaussian processes for a while, but I haven't prepared anything. But in that sense, it becomes very informal and a, more of a discussion than a sort of lecture. And that, we learned, helps, our, um, helps people learn as well. And then the sort of heart of Astro Hack Week is the hacking, of course. Um, this is last year, we drew a sort of hack atlas where people could write down where they were hacking so you would know where to find them. Um, but one thing I'd like to define is actually what a hack is. And I'm not going to define it. We asked our participants to define it last year. And so I found a few which I think are very good, sort of incorporate what we think hacks are. So one way to define a hack is as a small project with a clear goal that has to be completable in the time that you are there. You should not start you know, your new research project for the next half year, but instead say, here's a small thing that I can try. And either it works, then I can build on that, or it doesn't, then I'm just going to abandon it. Um, but that's one of the ways that Astrohack Week works. You need to have something that you can finish. Um, you can also, it's perfectly reasonable to cobble together a quick and dirty solution. What you will often hear is things like, oh, this is a toy problem that has nothing to do with reality, but if I can make this work, then and that works, then I can go to the more complex problem. Um, a lot of the times that involves really quick and dirty programming hacks, you know, code that you wouldn't want to release to other people, but just making it work in the time that you can. Um, and then the third sort of definition involves simplifying a complex problem. And that kind of goes back to this idea that it needs to be completable. And often to make it completable, you need to sort of compress it and simplify it down until you can really approach it. Um, in practice, here's how hacking works. Every day, people stand up after lunch and pitch projects. That can actually also, the first time we also made people stand up and say what they were good at. If they weren't pitching a project, they had to say what they were good at. Um, and everyone had to be good at something because everyone is. Um, but then people would pitch projects. There would be some time for people to discuss what they were working on. And this year we had lots of small hacks. There was lots of movement between groups. And then people hack. And that these hacks can take an hour. They can take four days. Um, depending on the project. At the end of each day, people pr uh, present their results. Their results are, it has to be something tangible. It can be a plot, it can be a blog post, it can be you know, a notebook, anything. But there has to be something tangible that comes out of a hack. That tangible thing could also be a plot that says, what I tried really didn't work. I failed on this, but that's OK. And then they learned something from it, and that's good too. So just to show you, maybe that will work. If I click on this. OK, so here's the example. We've been doing everything on Hackpad. And that is our sort of central open source of everything that happens. And anyone will add their hacks. And you can see there's people working on this right now. And they're sort of a bunch of active projects with links to like GitHub, uh, with links to, to IPython notebook, um, with links to explanations. And so any one of us can sort of go there and read. And that's where we also go at the end of the day to 
help people to look at hacks that happened. Hmm? Um, it's at this link. I think my slides will be online afterwards, right? Maybe? Yeah, I can put them online and then all the links will be there. Um, okay, so here's just, this is one of the few pictures where I have people smiling. <laughs> it turns out, no, it turns out people are not actually unhappy, they're just extremely concentrated. There's usually like a bunch of people sitting around a computer going like, trying to figure out something really hard. Um, but this is just really how we work. It's a bunch of people sitting around a laptop, really, really getting things done. Um, in practice, one way we encourage open science is by just asking people to do everything openly that happens at Astro Hack Week. All the descriptions at the Hackpad are officially, you know, can be seen. Uh, we encourage people to put stuff in Git and on GitHub just to be ever really open. And so that's, that's one of the, th basically the structure is the thing that we can steer. The other thing that we can steer that is really crucial to Astro Hack Week and that we can only steer to a certain extent are our participants because they're a huge part um, that makes up, makes up Astro Hack Week. And the decision that we made for Astro Hack Week early on that we decided that diversity promotes excellence and that we wanted to be a really, that we wanted Astro Hack Week to be a really diverse group. And when I mean diversity, I mean diversity along, of, along many different axes. And one of them is that we want a broad, diverse, diverse group between beginners and experts. That can be beginners and experts in statistics, in machine learning, in stellar evolution, in anything really. But it's again different from a summer school where you have sort of experts who teach and then everyone else is a novice. At Astro Hack Week, we're trying to get people from all levels um, to be involved. This also includes sort of diversity in academic seniority. We got under everything from undergrads from senior professors. And um, again, in a lot of ways, senior people can learn from junior people as well. Especially if you know, a junior pe person stands up and says, hey, I'm going to do a Git tutorial. And most of the senior people I know actually don't use Git. So sometimes they go like, hey, I can finally learn this Git thing my PhD student keeps talking about. Um, one of our reasons for doing this was foster exchange between topics. And so we also try to admit people from different disciplines within astronomy. And usually we actually have people from outside astronomy as well. There's usually a couple of computer scientists there. There's sometimes um, people from industry. There's sometimes, last year we had, I think, a chemical engineer. The year before we had someone who works on sort of geospatial map data, and somehow these people always also bring extremely valuable um, experiences in, in the group. And then we also care a lot about diversity and background, um, and with that I mean sort of, you know, diversity in terms of gender, in eth ethnicity and racial background, um, because again, we think it's important for the group to have that. So. Astro Hack Week is really as, uh, only as successful as its participants. So one question that we ask is, how do we get a good mix of participants? Where mix means, you know, we want a diverse group with different backgrounds and academic subdisciplines and everything from beginners to experts and ev all of our interesting, interesting things that people could be beginners to experts to, and also everything from undergrads to. Um, to academic seniority. And when I organized Astro Hack Week in New York last year, I sat down and said, these are my goals when I find my participants. I wanted to optimize the mix for all of these diverse things. Um, I wanted to reduce my own bias, um, sort of unconscious biases. I also kind of wanted it to be transparent and I wanted to be accountable for how we do that. Um, so that was basically me last year when we got 168 applications for 50 spots. And I was like, what, what do I do with this? Um, and I was very fortunate because my office mate is a computer scientist and he said, you're a data scientist, you should be data science with this. And so the first thing that we realized that once you have a group of people that you're happy with um, coming and that group is still larger than the spots that you have, 
what you have is a complex optimization problem. And it turns out computers are really a lot better at complex optimizations than humans are. So we decided to let a computer do it. Um, and so it's got sort of two and a half steps. One is find all, in your, in your input set, find all your, your participants that you think um, are appropriate to have at the workshop. And we ask a few questions like, why do you want to come to Astro Hack Week? And if someone had given a completely crazy answer, we had said, well, maybe, maybe that person isn't actually serious about coming. Um, then we also pre-selected a few experienced hackers because you do need some seeds for people who can spark you know, hacks and who know what they're doing. And then we used an algorithm to break ties between the rest of the people, conditioned on our, what we thought was our ideal mix of participants. And so here's for an example of one of our cat several categories. Uh, one was statistics experience, and that goes sort of from little to none to expert. And we ask people to rate themselves. Um, and here you can see the blue is the sort of fractions of our input data set. And then the black lines are the targets that we set the algorithms. And then in blue uh, and green is what actually comes out. Um, and so we decided we wanted a bunch of experts, we wanted a bunch of people who knew nothing, and then we wanted most of them in between. But that was a conscious choice that we kind of made. Um, and as you can see, the algorithm can't, doesn't always uh, completely manage to uh, hit the goals, and that is because it's optimizing over a large range of different categories. So in the grand scheme of things, depending on how imbalanced your input data set is, it can't always do that. Um, here's, here's the other, one of the ones I care about, we ask people, very much, care very much about, we ask people whether they consider themselves a minority in the field in terms of gender identity, and we also ask them whether they consider themselves a minority in terms of racial or ethnic identity. Um, and one thing that we learned previously is that representation matters a lot. Um, we heard a lot of from our, especially female participants, that they said they felt much more comfortable at the workshop because there was a significant fraction of women there. So that was also a conscious choice that we made to optimize um, beyond the ratios of the input data set because we thought it would be good for our workshop. This code is actually also an Astro Hack Week project. Um, it's online if you're interested for your own, own workshop. Um, I, really, I really care a lot about the sort of selection problem for participants, and I would love if people wanted to talk about that more because we're still sort of optimizing our approach and approving every time I do this. Okay, so I talked a lot about how we make Astro Hack Week work, but you might still say, well, but does it actually work? Does it what we're supposed to do? So we run a survey every, every year, and I'm not, I'm not a social scientist, so I'm not really qualified to evaluate this in the sort of quantitative way, but I can give you a few things. I can show you a few things that we learned from the survey. So one thing we asked them is, what did you learn at Esther Hack Week? One thing that people said they learned is not to be too afraid of Bayesian methods, which I thought was a great success. They learned sort of some machine learning and where the resources are, um, and there were sort of corrected misunderstandings about things they already knew. And that was the thing I would really wanted really to, to see that they d thought they learned some data science method. They learned machine learning, and especially they learned where to find resources that they can, can go to ourselves. And that was really one of our goals. Um, they also said they learned about new tools, they learned about practices, they improved their programming skills, they learned about profiling and commenting code, they learned about team coding. One year we enforced pair coding for a day. Um, and so these are all the practical things that we wanted people to take away, all the things that would make their, um, ma would make their day to day life better and make their computational results better and improve open science. And then there were sort of more social things. One, of the th one, one person answered that the main thing they took away from Astro Hack Week was that they're not alone. And they went on to explain that they're the only person in their department who does sort of data intensive research. And that person said they felt really alone and they didn't think anyone else was doing this. And coming to Astro Hack Week, they're like, there's this whole group of people and they came away with many connections that helped them. Um, and then there were sort of specific 
specific uh, interactions where they said, Brendan Brewer is a statistician we invited, um, and they sort of drove a new project forward by quite a lot just by meeting that person at Astro Hack Week. Um, these are all sort of anecdotal. We also asked them questions that relate to, to the more slow and goals. Um, and one of them is sort of, one of the big goals is to learn about data science career. So we just asked them, do you believe that Astrago is useful for your future career? And of the 28 people who responded, basically all of them said to some extent, yes, except for two who said they don't know. Um, so similar, we have similar results for the questions that they think the, the skill are applicable outside academia, which is also important in terms of making sure researchers might transition to industry um, from academia. We asked them, do you feel that the things they learned improved their day-to-day -day research? Um, and most of them did, which I was really pleased by because we really wanted everything to be applicable. And then we also asked them whether they felt that it made them more comfortable to do open science. And a lot of people, there were a lot of discussions about how to do open science, how to write papers out in the open, um, and most of them came away with a feeling that they're happier about that. Um, do, I, do I have time? OK. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, I'm going to show you just a couple of projects to give you a range of ideas of what the kind of stuff that come up. OK, so here's one. Um, they're all really sort of astronomy so I'm not going to go into much of the detail. But here's a project that I picked for one main reason. And the main reason is that the paper is written by a group from uh, Chile and a statistician from New Zealand. And so these are two groups that are very geographic in very different geographical um, locations. They come from different backgrounds and work in different institutions. One is an astronomy department, the other one is a statisti statistics department. Um, but they managed to get together at Astro Hack Week and start a project that ended up um, in a paper a few months after Astro Hack Week. So, and this was a, mo this was a project that used um, some very complex sampling algorithms and very complicated statistical methods to find planets in, in um, what's called radial velocity data from stars. And that's generally a hard problem. Um, and they managed to, to get a good result out of that as a, and you know, that, that collaboration started Astro Hack Week and persisted beyond that. Um, this is a project from this year. Not everything is in astronomy. So that was a project where they looked at um, diffraction microscopy of molecules and one thing that we discussed a lot at Astrac Week this year was optimization methods, including stochastic gradient descent. And there was this group that said, we want to learn more about stochastic gradient descent, and we want to use it. And I think, I think this is going to, yeah, this is a video. And then the video shows you how, how the model sort of slowly converges on the molecular structure, which is quite similar to the one they put in. Um, so that's a project that has nothing to do with astronomy, but uses expertise that people built up from astronomy to solve that kind of problem. Um, there are sort of software projects. SN Cosmo is a big uh, software code that deals with exploding stars. And they were sort of models that for a long time should have been implemented but weren't. And at Astro Hack Week, a couple of people sat down and said, that's going to be my hack. We're just going to implement this new feature in this software. Um, and that happened. There were a couple of people who decided they wanted to learn more about machine learning, and they picked a project they are interested in. In this case, these are sort of large-scale structures in the universe. So every point in here is a galaxy. Um, and then they decided they really wanted to find filaments in there and sort of clusters in there. And they used machine learning. And here is an image of the filaments that they found, the filament confidence. And in black, you can see these are all what the machine learning algorithms are, think is filaments. And this is what the machine learning algorithm thinks is sort of clusters over densities of galaxies. And so they started out not really knowing anything about machine learning. And by the end of the week, they had this sort of working example. Um, people write tutorials. Today, we had a tutorial about auto differentiation. And that's something where someone said, I would like to learn auto differentiation. And that was a new experiment this year where we said, 
you learn about auth you group learn about auto differentiation, and by the end of the week, you're going to give a breakout on this. Um, and that's a kind of scary thing for people to do, but it was useful because there was expertise in the room that people could immediately uh, um, um, use once they hit a point, even in a breakout session, where someone asked a question they couldn't directly answer. So that worked really well. There's also some projects that have kind of nothing to do with astronomy. Somehow we ended up talking a lot about color maps this week. And so one of the hacks was uh, a few people who did this project called Urban Goggles, where uh, they make custom color maps based on queries uh, about cities on Flickr. So for example, they gave it a query string Manhattan at night. Um, and then it produced a color map for your plots based on that. Or they gave it San Francisco, and you know San Francisco has a different color map. So there's these kind of projects usually that people also do to teach themselves stuff. Um, what else do I have? Um, this was an one that was born out of a need, because we have a lot of people at Astro Hack Week want to learn something. And we have a lot of expertise at Astro Hack Week. And it's not always clear how to pair up people. So these people asked, asked the participants, what do you want to learn about and what are you expert on? And then they just build a graph model for matching up people. And so every person, you know, this person wants to learn about gra probabilistic graphical models. This person knows about gra probabilistic graphical models. So there is an error between them. And they did now the same. I don't have a plot for that, but they did the same for breakout session where they say, these people want to learn. These people have the expertise. Here's how you should do your breakout session. Um, and then the final one I have is they built a Twitter bot based on David Hogg's. Um, David Hogg is a faculty member at NYU, based on his blog and his, um, his Twitter account. And they just wanted to learn how natural language processing and deep learning worked. So they built a Twitter bot that would just respond to you if you tweeted it. It's unfortunately no longer active. Um, but you know, they said they learned a lot from it. And it was a kind of fun thing that they wouldn't do in their daily research life, even though they're going to carry this knowledge back with them. And they might be useful. So as a last thing, I have a few lessons that we've learned so far, and we keep learning. One thing that we learned is that participants come to Astro Hack Week with vastly different expectations and goals. And that's a function of the diversity of people who come. And that's both a good thing, because Anyone can get in something interesting and useful out of Astro Hack Week. We have people who come with the expressive goal to learn about how hacking works and how, hack, how to organize hack weeks. We have, for example, undergrads often come to learn about methods, or even PhD students learn about sort of machine learning and Bayesian statistics, all the things they think will be useful in their research. Um, it's also a problem because it makes it hard to evaluate whether the workshop was successful. Because if everyone comes with different goals, then it's hard to find common metrics to evaluate whether it worked. The other thing that we learned is that student travel support is absolutely crucial. We had, I had people come to me and say, I am glad you could fund me because my supervisor would not pay for this. So there are you know, cases where supervisors said, oh, just go to a traditional conference. This isn't really useful. Um, also, if you do want to have undergraduate students, there's almost never any money for undergrads to travel. And our, the undergrads that came here have always been incredibly involved and have been incredibly, uh, made incredibly valuable contributions. So we really encourage to have them there. Um, this relates directly to the more slow working group. The space where you are matters. Um, in various ways, it needs to facilitate hacking. And in, in that sense, we're extremely grateful to BIDS because this space was perfect, because it had these tables that you can easily reconfigure, all the chairs move. And so you can quickly move around and say, my group needs a table, and then you just go pull it to the side and do it. There's a bit of opportunity for people to sort of uh, have breakout sessions while the rest of them works. And that's been really important, too. Um, sp so space is really important to us. One thing that we continue to address is the imposter syndrome. Is everyone here know what the imposter syndrome is? Um, the imposter syndrome is basically the feeling that you don't belong into the group where you currently are. 
that everyone around you is much better at everything than you is, and you're an imposter. You don't belong here. And at some point, someone will find out that you don't belong here and will throw you out. Um, and it turns out that that happens. We learned that already during our first Astro Hack Week. Um, we, that happens to basically everyone. We told people this year, it happens to the undergrads. It also happens to the senior professors. I said earlier that our lecturers, you know, every lecturer I talked to last year before their talk, they were like, oh my goodness, there's like this person in the room who's much better at this than I do. And what if I say something wrong? And oh my goodness. And that is also kind of an expression of the imposter syndrome. So one of the things that we've done is just explicitly address it at the beginning and tell people, you will feel that way, and you will feel that way because everyone around you is an expert at something. They'll be an expert at different things, and that means that it can feel like everyone around you is an expert at, more expert at everything than you are. Um, and I think having people, having, making people have that in their minds help, helps address it. But if anyone has ideas about how to do that better, I would love to discuss that with you too. Um, and as I said earlier, especially for minority participants, just having representation helps a lot as well. Um, in practical terms, food and coffee are absolutely crucial, um, especially the coffee. And one important thing that we learned is that you want to have it in-house. You don't want to have people go and fracture up because they will fracture up along the groups that already know each other. So you really want people to stay in there, which means, which means getting and catering. Um, the evenings are important to us too. It turns out it is really useful to know a bar nearby that has big tables, Wi-Fi, and beer. And I can guarantee you that people will just go and keep hacking. Um, that happened every time this, this uh, so far. Where and it's, hmm? Where, where did you find it? Uh, convenient. Here. Here. Um, I just followed people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. So this year's organizer, hmm? Yeah. Yeah. So Kyle, our organizer, was the one who sort of scoped out places. It is, it is a good thing to know. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle would be the person to ask. That is true. Yeah, we did, we tried to get, we tried to get sort of, um, usually have one afternoon or one evening somewhere else. And we were quite lucky that GitHub offered us their space for the afternoon on Wednesday. And so on Wednesday, we sort of hacked at GitHub and it was, it was incredibly exciting for everyone because we we do all our work on GitHub, and so just to be there um, was very cool. It's also just a very good space for hacking, so a lot of it got done. Um, there's also a lot of things we actually don't know, um, and so we still don't have a good idea of how we can measure success. We ask people whether they think they were successful um, and learned something and sort of hit the metrics, but Measuring this quantitatively is actually quite difficult, and that's sort of an unsolved problem. Um, sort of one question that I keep grappling with is what's the sort of ideal mix of participants in terms of their different attributes that we're interested in? Um, we, made a we made certain choices for this. It is not clear to us that those are the best or ideal choices. So we continue to think about that too. Um, another question is what's the right balance between learning and project work? The way we did it, it was we had lectures or tutorials in the mornings and then the afternoons free for hacking and um, for breakout sessions. And this year, for the first time, we did it that we had only four days of lectures instead of five, and the final day was just hacking. Um, we'll see how that one works out. And then one question that I keep also thinking about is how we can mitigate imposter syndrome, how can we make shy people stand up and talk as well? Um, because we don't want Astro Hack Week to be dominate, dominated by a, uh, by a few people who are very confident in their abilities, because that, again, increases intimidation for other people. So let me finish with asking you, should you run a Hack Week? And I think here are the reasons why you might want to run a Hack Week. You might want to run a Hack Week if you have more data than you might know what to do with, or, and or your data is very complex. Um, you should also run it if you think 
you might need better or new methods that you need to get in maybe from other fields. Um, if you think this kind of collaboration and networking is important beyond what you get done in sort of um, the breaks at traditional conferences, Astro Hack Week is a really good way, or Hack Week is a really good way to make that happen because there is this space and there is this time for people to start these collaborations and sort of get projects off the ground. Um, we think it's also been really good at promoting open science and we keep hoping that people will carry that back into their home institutions. Again, how to measure that is kind of difficult. So, conclusion, yes, you should run a Hack Week. Um, there is no, it's not, not just Astro Hack Week anymore. Actually, next week there will be Neuro Hack Week in Seattle. Um, and that was sort of originally based off Astro Hack Week for neuroscientists. And then uh, there will be a Geo Hack Week in November as well. And both of these are at the East Science Center where Astro Hack Week got started as well. So they've been very active in this. Um, I've put some resources on the slides if you're interested. Our website is on there. We have a GitHub organization for Astro Hack Week where there's all our materials. And actually, most of our organization happens in GitHub issues. So if you want to you know, follow along with some of our discussions that we've had about how to make this successful and how to invite speakers, um, that's all on there. Um, there's our hackpad if you want to look, look at our hacks. I've written a bunch of blog posts about how to organize Astro Hack Week with all my experiences from last year. And I continue to keep writing blog posts as I learn more. Um, yeah, the, the tool that we wrote is on there as well. And then there was an incredibly insightful blog post earlier that was called The Horror of Hack Days by someone who really hates hack days for many of the reasons that we think about the imposter syndrome. And we tried very much this, this um, this time to address uh, that type of person and make it um, easier for them. Was that one from one of yours? No. Okay. No, no, no. That was someone just from tech. Um, but this got linked somewhere on Twitter, and I saw it, and I thought, oh my goodness, I bet there's people like that among us as well. And I bet there's people who might not want to come to Esther Hack Week because they might feel like that. And so we've been thinking about how to address this and how to make Astro Hack Week welcoming um, to people who are more maybe introverted or something like that. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, this has been a big group effort. Kyle Barbary has been the main organizer here. Um, and I'm sure if you have specific questions, he'd be in, uh, happy to answer too. The organization team in general has been Carl Barbary, Phil Marshall, David Hogg, Jen Jake Van der Plas, and me. We've been sort of doing this for the last three years. Um, I think Fernando was on the organizing team the first time too. Um, and then Brian McPhee has been helping me in, um, a lot with, with the participant selection part of it. Um, so thank you again, and I'll take any questions you might have. <laughs>